Guys, Dwayne Estes here, Executive Director of the Southeastern Grasslands Initiative. I want to show you something really cool. This is a set of books that has recently been published uh, for the Middle Tennessee region by some historians out of Nashville. I want to make sure I give credit to Doug Drake, Jack Masters, and Bill Perrier. Uh, this is one volume called Founding of the Cumberland Settlements. What it does, it takes um, the reader through the process of the discovery of Nashville in 1779 and goes through a period where um, uh, for the next, say, 25 years, settlers begin to come to that region. And as you open this book up, there's some great stuff in here. For example, here's some maps uh, where it shows the Isaac Lindsay expedition who went down the Cumberland River in 1767. It was one of the earliest expeditions to the area that is now Nashville. There's a lot of great original artwork in here. Um, for example, uh, the artwork of David Wright, who's a Nashville area artist, has done a lot of famous uh, uh, art pieces. There's a lot of great uh, photographs here that show the old original roads that the first settlers and some of these were Native American trails before that. And some of these were even bison traces or buffalo paths. But in the back is, is really the coolest part I want to show you. There's an index to, all, to a set of topographic maps that makes up the back half of this. And what I want to do is show you the area north of Nashville in Robertson County, Tennessee. Here's the Kentucky-Tennessee state line. And let's go to A9 on this index. And I want to take a look at that. So I'm going to open up my topographic maps now that form in the back. We're going to go to A9. And what you can see then is that on these topo maps, they actually map the original plots of land that were granted to Revolutionary War soldiers. So if you were a private in the Army during the Revolutionary War, you would be given usually 640 acres of land for your service in, in battle. And so um, oftentimes what would happen is those landowners would send a surveyor ahead. Oftentimes they would come all the way from North Carolina, and they would survey this property. And, and part of what that entails is they would uh, use an ax or something to mark off the boundary trees. So for example, here, they would mark an elm, then they would walk east and notice that they said, oh, there was a stake in the northeast corner. They would do that when there was not a tree there. They would use a wooden stake. Then they would walk south and there was two red oak trees. And then they'd go west to a post oak. So we can take all of this evidence uh, based on the kinds of trees they were noting, such as post oaks. Well, those are species that are found primarily in oak savanna habitats. But notice that they also give sometimes some more specific types of comments. So for example, they didn't just say post oak. They said post oak in the barrens, stake in the barrens, edge of the barrens. The barrens were these vast grasslands the size of Connecticut and Rhode Island that as of 1800 occupied about three and a half million acres. So the final thing I want to show you is this. Those, when those um, land grants were given, most of the um, original settlers were given properties along the major waterways, like here along the Red River, or here along another uh, fork of the Red River. But notice that almost no lands were granted in the zone in between. That in itself is some really substantial evidence. Why is that? Because that area was nearly an open and treeless plain. There was almost no water on that plain. Uh, all of the land has sinkholes in it, so the streams drain underground. So this area was specifically avoided in the very first settlement of the region. Well, what's significant is after about 25 to 30 years of the early settlers getting there, then people started looking to this area to settle. And they realized then that it wasn't a barren area, which they thought, they used that term when they thought that it was not good land. But they realized after about 25 to 30 years, it was actually the best land, the most fertile land. And so it was in the early 1800s when these were converted to extensive croplands. So I wanted just to highlight the um, importance of some of these archival records these historians had to spend decades going through the state archives back in North Carolina and also in Nashville and other places to dig through and map these records for us. So that's a pretty cool thing, guys, um, and I'll leave you with that.